Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sinus of FanDuel as we break down the winners and the losers for round one of the NFL Draft. What's happening, Jim? I am all good, Greg. Last night was a lot of fun. Uh, getting to see like a live event play out again, getting to watch Twitter reactions, and just having things to talk about again. It was a delight. Lived up to the hype, which I think was tough to do. So I had a great time, and I'm ready for more fantasy relevant guys in rounds two and three tonight. How are you doing? As I said before this started, Jim, I just wanted Dave Gettleman not to screw it up, and I don't think he did. So a successful round one uh, for me. Also very excited for round two and round three. Let's get into some of the winners, though, from the first night of the NFL draft. And, sir, we are going to begin with Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, the last pick of the first round, but potentially the most beneficial pick of the first round from a fantasy football perspective. Why do you like the new Brian Westbrook? Yeah, apparently the better Brian Westbrook. And I think that last night throughout the draft, for the first 31 picks, there was a pretty big question about who was the biggest winner from a fantasy perspective. I think guys like Drew Locke were in the discussion there. Baker Mayfield's in that discussion. There were a couple of winners, but there was no bona fide winner. And then the Chiefs go out and draft Clyde edwards Lair with the 32nd overall pick. And it's like, okay, pretty easy. That makes it a lot easier on us as content people. We know who was the number one winner from the draft. That is Clyde edwards Lair. And not only is he the biggest winner, but I think now with this selection, he becomes the first overall pick in rookie drafts in Dynasty for this year, because what you're getting is a guy who is going to be tied to the Kansas City Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes, and Andy Reid for likely the next five years, that full length of the rookie contract, and that's attractive. What we want in fantasy football out of our running backs is to get them in good offenses that will score touchdowns and to get them to get passing down work. We know Mahomes will be efficient, but also of all the guys in this class who are going to get passing down work, it was going to be Edwards Elaire as that top guy there because he was a beast in the passing game at LSU. 55 receptions for 453 yards. He lined up out wide on a pretty regular basis as well. So they can get creative with him. That's the thing that you love about running backs in the Chiefs offense is it's not just targets. They're not Leonard Fournette targets. They are getting them targets downfield where you can do a lot of damage in a hurry. I would still expect Damian Williams to get some work in this offense in year one. So the year one outlook, we're not expecting like a bell cow back here for Clyde Edwards Elaire, but Damian's contract runs up after this year. I believe this will be his age 28 season. He's not a young pup by any means. So if you can deal with a little bit of a committee in year one, I think that it's really worth the trade-off here for Clyde edwards Elaire. He is in play for redraft for sure, but he is the no-doubt surefire 1.01 in Dynasty with this landing spot and the unquestioned winner from night one of the draft. It's actually amazing how many tweets, and maybe I just follow too many fantasy and gambling analysts, but once uh, Clyde edwards Elaire was picked, all the tweets were just said 1.01. And that's all it said repeatedly because he is a monstrous winner. His stock is rising. We knew Kansas City at some point was going to draft a future running back, and they did. And he is better than Brian Westbrook, potentially, better than LaShawn McCoy, potentially. He's the only first-round running back ever drafted in the Andy Reid era, and that's why he's 1.01. Let's continue on, Jim. Another player whose stock is up after last night. You and I were just talking about it before we started live here. And it's Henry Ruggs. He was the first wide receiver off the board before Jerry Judy, before CeeDee Lamb, Mike Mayock. And the Oakland Raiders selected Henry Ruggs. What'd you think, man? Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I think that's the word that I would use for it because we went into this process assuming that Henry Ruggs would be a better real world asset than he'd be a fantasy asset because his speed is so impactful when it comes to actual football because he opens up so much for everyone else in the field. But at Alabama, he didn't get a ton of usage. And guys in this mold don't get a ton of usage. So my assumption going in is that Ruggs will be just kind of like an okay fantasy asset, not being this, you know, big priority. He's still not going to be a huge priority for me, but I don't think he could have had a better landing spot than what he got with Las Vegas. He goes out to Las Vegas. His competition for targets is Darren Waller, Tyrell Williams, Hunter Renfro. And I think that's probably the best situation he could have been in. And the thing with, with Ruggs, you look at Derek Carr, and we know that he's not the most aggressive quarterback. He doesn't go downfield all that much. But throughout his career, when he has gone downfield, he has been effective. And Ruggs wasn't just a deep ball specialist at Alabama. He also would take these short passes from Tua Tunga Vailoa and take them to the house. So he has a diverse skill set. And I think that my outlook for Henry Ruggs 
could not have wound up better than it's going to wind up being here with him being that first round selection for the Las Vegas Raiders. Now it's worth mentioning. I'm still not going to be as high on him as I am on guys like Jerry Judy, like CD lamb, like Justin Jefferson, potentially just because the way they operate is going to lead to more usage. So I still expect Henry Ruggs to fall behind those guys in our dynasty rookie drafts. But the outlook for Ruggs is so much better than what I was expecting going in. I think that's the most noteworthy thing here is relative to expectations, Henry Ruggs got a pretty major upgrade. I think that's a great thing for him. Again, I'm not super worried about Derek Carr not being most aggressive passer just because Ruggs is a talented guy who can you know, kind of take a slot to the, uh, you know, a, a slant to the house. So I think that that's not a major downside for him. And relative to the expectations, Henry Ruggs got a pretty major boost last night, which was not true for most of the receivers who went in the first round. Henry Ruggs in a really good spot to succeed here in year one with Oakland. You name the other players competing for targets with him. We'll see what happens. I was surprised that Ruggs went off the board before Judy, before Lamb. But Oakland, rather Las Vegas, gets their guy in Henry Ruggs. One more player whose stock is up from last night, and that's Jalen Rhaegar. Now, it's funny because, and of course, I'm thinking Rhaegar Targaryen here, but um, Jalen Rager is the player that goes through Philadelphia when every Eagles fan that I was looking at was like, oh, Justin Jefferson, Justin Jefferson, Justin Jefferson. And then they drafted Rager, and you just kind of hear them deflate a little bit. Why should the Eagles fans like Rhaegar Targaryen? Yeah, I think that it's interesting here because I agree. I, I like Justin Jefferson a lot. I think that he was super productive in college. He had a good combine as well. So Justin Jefferson's is probably going to be a really good player. And you could have potentially put him as one of the winners on this list. But the reason I put Jalen Rager here is because, again, it goes back to what we discussed with Henry Ruggs before, with expectation. The expectation for Jalen Rager may not have been that of a first-round pick. He was a first-round pick in a couple of mocks, likely going to the Saints in a couple of spots. But now he winds up 21st overall, ahead of a really talented wide receiver in Justin Jefferson. He goes to a spot where he can get usage right away because you look at the Eagles, their wide receiver depth chart is – it's not great, uh, to say the least. Alshon Jeffrey is always banged up. Deshaun Jackson always banged up. And Rager is going to play outside. So that means that when they decide to go with those two tight end sets with uh, Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, Rager will probably still be on the field. It gives him another fast player in this offense. I know Rager's 40 time was a relative disappointment at the combine, but it seems like he bulked up there you know, to try to, to help himself in other areas. So I think the actual speed for Jalen Rager is better than the 4.47 he ran, which means that he'll, he'll be that lid lifter that Carson Wentz was so desperately missing from this offense last year. This is a good thing for Carson Wentz because it should upgrade his, his receiver corpse, maybe not as much as it would have been with a guy like Justin Jefferson, who also does have that speed. But at the end of the day, it's another weapon in this offense. It means, you know, we're, we're shoving down guys on the depth chart who were playing prominent roles for the Eagles last year. That's a good thing. Uh, decreasing the reliance on guys like Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson. So that's a good thing for them. But again, for Jalen Rager, I think he is the biggest winner here in this equation because draft capital matters. And the draft capital tied to Jalen Rager was very high. He goes to a landing spot where he can get targets right away. So again, like Ruggs, relative to expectation, things go pretty well for Jalen Rager, even if he's not quite in that same tier, again, as guys like Judy, like Lamb, and like Justin Jefferson. I think it was clear how desperate the Eagles were for a wide receiver last year when everybody got hurt, right? You mentioned Alshon Jeffrey. Nelson Aguilar uh, was banged up as well. So many of these pass catchers, Deshaun Jackson too, were banged up. And he went down to the J.J. Ortega-White side, and there's nothing happened. And you knew that the Eagles were absolutely desperate to get Carson Wentz weapons, and now they have with Jalen Rager, who, again, isn't one of those top flight wide receivers that you mentioned potentially, or even Justin Jefferson. But he should be in a position to succeed in year one, which means his stock certainly up on night one of the NFL draft. All right, we chatted about some of the players whose stock was up after night one. Let's talk about the players whose stock dropped a little bit farther than we kind of expected after the first night of the NFL draft. And we'll go and begin with C.D. Lamb, who went a little bit later than we thought. And the usage drop isn't exactly huge. We don't hate C.D. Lamb or anything. But it may not be as bright as we would have hoped playing in Dallas across from Amari Cooper. He's not necessarily the wide receiver one on his team quite yet. So he could have been, but it's not there. Where does that 
put you in drafting CD Lamb in fantasy football this year, Jim? Yeah, I'll still be in the CD Lamb for sure because this is not a major downgrade for CD Lamb. Like, I think my expectation was Las Vegas. If he had gone there, he could have been a stud right away because of the competition for targets. Now, he goes to Dallas, and I'm never going to complain about getting a wide receiver, playing eight games inside and playing 16 games with Dak Prescott. Because Dak Prescott is going to be really good this year for fantasy. He's going to be so efficient, and we're going to love this offense. The problem is there are a lot of mouths to feed here for Dallas. And that's a slight problem because CeeDee Lamb is a high-volume guy. He is a, a really fun wide receiver. But when you're competing with Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup for targets and Ezekiel Elliott for targets rather than Hunter Renfro and Tyrell Williams, that's a major shift in expectation here. So CeeDee Lamb is a talented wide receiver who is playing indoors and be catching passes from Dak Prescott. Those are all really good things for fantasy, but the biggest driver of value in fantasy is volume. And the volume expectation for CeeDee Lamb went down last night relative to where I expected it to be going in. So CeeDee Lamb will still be a very relevant fantasy player, not just now, but into the future, assuming that they do get that Dak Prescott contract worked out and keep him around for a long time to come. He's going to be relevant here but it's hard to see him turning into, you know, a 25% target market share guy when you have such good options elsewhere on that team. I still like CeeDee Lamb because it's hard to hate anyone in a Dak Prescott offense, but I wish he would have gone somewhere with a couple of more targets to the taking. But hey, it may not be great for fantasy, but for real world football to watch this Cowboys team slinging it to these guys, that's at least a nice little compensation to get that in return. A nice little consolation to have this fun offense we'll get to watch throughout the year. So tough landing spot for fantasy football in CeeDee Land, but he's still relevant and it's going to be fun to watch. So it's not all negative, even if he does get a slight downgrade here. Dak Prescott, stock up. For sure, with the weapon, the addition of weapon C.D. Lamb, but his value, oh, a little bit down based on where he ended up with the Dallas Cowboys. Like you said, he's not competing with the likes of Tyrell Williams and Hunter Renfro. Instead of Tamari Cooper, Ezekiel Elliott, a little bit of a difference there. C.D. Lamb's going to be a good NFL pro, and definitely consider drafting him on draft day. All right, let's move on to another player who stock a little bit down from last night. It's Justin Herbert. Not a surprise where he ends up with the Los Angeles Chargers. Third quarterback off the board after Joe Burrow and Tua Tagovailoa. Justin Herbert with the Chargers may not start from day one. You believe his stock's actually down, though. It's kind of a surprise because I figured this is where he'd end up. Yeah, it's all, it's all about expectations, Greg. And the expectation for me was that he would go to the Chargers. So from that perspective, it's not a downgrade, especially because he's throwing to Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Hunter Henry, Austin Eckler. Like, that's awesome. That's a really good unit to have. The problem is they traded up back into the first round and gave up their second and third round picks and did not address left tackle. I do not know who will be playing left tackle for the Chargers this year. It may be you, Greg, so keep your phone on, because I don't know where they're going to go here. It's a pretty grim outlook. Now, they did improve the offense line this offseason. They've got Brian Bulaga for right tackle. Trey Turner is a really talented guard. But left tackle is a scary position, especially for a quarterback like Herbert, who had some issues when things got messy last year at Oregon. His adjusted yards per attempt was 6.8 when he was under pressure, according to Pro Football Focus. That's a little bit lower than you would hope. His numbers also dipped when he faced really good competition. So, like, he won the game for Oregon against Wisconsin, but his passing efficiency in that game was pretty terrible. And, you know, he struggled a bit against Utah as well. When he faced good defenses, Justin Herbert – didn't exactly shine. So my expectation, my hope for Justin Herbert going to Los Angeles would be that he would go there, get to throw to those, those fun weapons, and they would get a left tackle in the second round. That's not going to happen now. So that's why the expectation, the stock is down for Justin Herbert, because I don't know what they're going to do at left tackle. They could trade for Trent Williams, maybe with a future pick, but it's hard to do that with their cap situation and all the guys that to give extensions to because that defense has a lot of dudes who are going to have to get paid here in the very near future. That's why I'm a little bit soured on Justin Herbert. I was hoping they get a tackle, a left tackle in the second round or maybe trade up for a second for a tackle, which is what I thought they were doing when they traded up. But I think with that, that black hole on the left side of the line at left guard and left tackle, it's hard to get super jazzed here. So I was with you where I expect him to go to, to Los Angeles. He will have good skill position guys, but that line makes me really nervous, especially given what happened to Herbert when things broke down in college. So relative to expectations, the air is slightly down on Justin Herbert with his new team. 
the Chargers would have just traded back into that first round and drafted a left tackle. It was maybe a different conversation today. But Justin Herbert has so many weapons with the Chargers that if he gets a chance to start over to Rod Taylor, well, the sky may be the limit. We'll see what Justin Herbert becomes uh, with the NFL or in the NFL, and we'll see if Herbert will be a fantasy quarterback for you this year in 2020. One last player whose stock is down, Jim, and that's another quarterback, and that's Jordan Love, the fourth and final quarterback that was off the board uh, last night. Goes to Green Bay, and that was the pick that everybody was talking about towards the end of the draft last night and certainly here uh, the day after the draft. Love goes almost exactly where Aaron Rodgers did, almost the exact same age that Brett Favre was when Rodgers was drafted, same age between Love and Rodgers uh, on their draft night. Love's not going to start in day one, and the clock certainly is ticking on Aaron Rodgers here. What do you think of the pick, and when do you think we'll see Jordan Love? Yeah, I think that when you look at the contract of Aaron Rodgers, it's pretty clear we're not going to see Jordan Love for at least two seasons because there's a lot of dead money. And we're not not talking like Todd Gurley dead money on Aaron Rodgers. It's like $36 million in dead money if they were to move on from him within these first two years. It's $17 million in dead money if they were to release him after the 2021 season, so it's after two years. And then it's basically a very minimal dead cap hit heading into 2023. So Jordan Love's going to sit for a minimum of two years, and I would say it's probably likely three years, given the way things break out. And after that third year is when the, the, the Packers have to decide if they want to pick up that fifth-year option. So it's very questionable what they're going to do here and how they're going to handle things, but we know from the outset Jordan Love is going to sit. That's a bad thing. It's also concerning where he went in the draft because there aren't a lot of success stories from that part of the draft. There have now been 13 quarterbacks drafted in the top uh, in the first round since 2000, but outside the top 20 picks. And that group does include Aaron Rodgers, as you mentioned, and Lamar Jackson. Both those guys are MVPs in the NFL. That's good. But none of the others have been successes. They have zero top 10 seasons, net expected points, and one top 15 season. That one top 15 season was by Jason Campbell. So I'm not sure you're necessarily classifying him as a success story either. So Love is going to sit. They don't have a ton of playmakers around him at those skill positions, which could change by 2022, whenever he winds up being the starter. And they, he didn't get a huge vote of confidence from evaluators by allowing him to drop this far in the draft. So it's really tough to love anything about the situation for Jordan Love. He, you will get him at a discounted price in dynasty drafts now because people will realize that this landing spot is not good. But even at that discounted price, I'm not sure I'm going to buy in. I had questions around the talent going in and now I have questions around the landing spot as well. I kind of think that if you are someone who wanted to buy into Jordan Love in fantasy, this was the worst case scenario you could have got. Yeah, because we're not going to see Jordan Love anytime soon. Although I will say Aaron Rodgers has been relatively injury prone over the past few years. He takes a lot of big hits. The shoulders uh, have obviously been a problem for him. Jordan Love, now a solid backup, at least we think, with Green Bay. I think my favorite stat from last night was since Aaron Rodgers was drafted 15 years ago, the only skill position Packer, the Packers have drafted in the first round, quarterback. That was last night with Jordan Love. No weapons for Aaron Rodgers, no help for Aaron Rodgers. Are we seeing the end of Aaron Rodgers? It's coming soon. That's going to do it for us here on the FanDuel. Hurry up, Jim. This has been a blast. I cannot wait for the rest of the draft. I'm sure next week we will talk about some more winners and losers. Yeah, Greg, there's going to be a lot to discuss next week, too, because we're going to see a lot of running backs off the board tonight. Uh, we'll see maybe some front quarterback spots, see where Jalen Hurts goes, a lot of wide receivers, too. So tonight is going to be potentially even more fantasy impactful than what we saw last night. So we'll be back again Monday to wrap that up. I am looking forward to that, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy the rest of the draft. Absolutely. You too, Jim. This has been a blast. I cannot wait to talk more with you next week. A lot of wide receivers left, a lot of running backs left. We haven't seen a tight end go here either. I know you're anxiously awaiting Jake Fromm. So, so much to talk about next week. For Jim Sonis, I am Greg Sussman. Thanks so much for watching the FanDuel. Hurry up. Enjoy the rest of the draft. Enjoy the weekend. We'll see you back here next week for another edition of the FanDuel. Hurry up.